Welcome to the Indie Pub, a laid-back interview show dedicated to the world of self and indie publishing. I'm your host, Jay Rushing, author of the self-published fantasy noir novel Radio, and a beverage buff with a passion for deep dives and good times. Every two weeks, a guest will step into the pub with a publishing-related topic and a favorite drink for us to explore and enjoy. Whether you want to sharpen your craft, snag a new cocktail recipe, or just have a laugh, there's always a seat and a full glass waiting for you at the Indie Pub. Welcome to the Indie Pub. Today we're talking about the ins, outs, ups, and downs of co-authoring a novel with Allegra Pescatore, author of Where Shadows Lie and NACL, Eye of the Storm, and Christopher Russell, author of Divinity's Twilight Rebirth. But before we dive in, tell us a little bit about what we're drinking here in the pub today. Sure will. Uh, we are drinking gin and tonics. Mine is made with uh, sapphire, uh, Bombay Sapphire Gin and San Pellegrino Tonic, which is a little bit more bitter than most, with a squeeze of lemon. Perfect. Oh, we'll get into the lemon versus lime later on. Yes. That's one of the one of the contentious angles with the gin and tonic. All right, so why don't you both tell us a little bit about yourselves and your work? Sure. Um, I'm an own voices disabled author. I write in both science fiction and fantasy with a lot of humor thrown in for giggles mostly. And um, I mostly work with co-authors. That's kind of my thing. And I'm Christopher Russell, one of her adopted ugly ducklings. We're working <laughs> on getting prettier as we go. And I'm the author of the Divinity's Twilight fantasy series. Like Allegra, I write epic fantasy. That's one of the ways that we got connected. And I'm a convert to fantasy writing. I started off in the uh, mechanical engineering field. So if you have any questions about uh, technical specifics or how to take magic and steampunk and put them together, then I'm your guy. Be careful about putting that out there. You may get some emails. (laughs) All right. So actually, let's pull that out a little bit. Um, Not the engineering part, but how you guys got together. So how how does that even work? (laughs) What what, what does broaching the subject of co-authoring look like are there special co-authoring pickup lines it's like hey want to write a book together or, or is it is it something more organic i would i would imagine it, it's more the latter but go ahead and explain that to us oh wow well um i feel like mostly we found each other because we both published at about the same time ah. in the same genre in kind of a similar niche and have been it, you know how sometimes you you live in a city and you keep running into the same person over and over and over again because mm-hmm. you end up at like the same businesses and events. It was like that. We like I'd be on an interview and then a week later Chris would be on one or vice versa, and we ended up like adminning the same big group. So eventually we started talking and got an idea, which is nice. always the worst part. <laughs> mm-hmm. I came to Allegra and it, there was this idea brimming in the back of my head for a tragedy that had a, um, a central twist that something was going to happen to the hero and the book was going to be written from two different directions, one starting at the beginning and coming to the middle and one starting at the end and coming to the middle. And Allegra said to me, you know what, that's a great idea, but what if we make it really funny? What if we take that tragedy and wrap it in comedy and wrap it in satire and wrap it in a Percy and wrap it in a book jacket? That, that's one of our taglines we're going with. Nice. But uh, uh, Allegra just, she makes everything better. That A lot of that is her experience co-authoring, and also she just has this great sense of humor. And since we're essentially the same person, we, we've discovered from what we write and the, the way that we approach characters and tropes and things, we've just had a ton of fun putting our sense of humor into this work. Nice. I would imagine that um, similar personality probably streamlines the process a little bit. Mm-hmm. It does. It, it helps not to have to kind of explain why something is a good idea, but just be able to be like, hey, this is an idea. The other person says, oh, yeah, I see why that is a good idea. Our, our text chat back and forth is basically one person has an idea and then the other one goes, yes, with lots of S's. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and Allegra, what, so you, I know you've co-authored a lot. What, what are you uh, what number are you up to now? Uh, uh, oh, wow. Um, my number of co-authored books is currently everywhere in production is four, two oof. with E. Sands, uh, one of which is out, which is NACL, and one of which, which is coming out. Um, then I have a book uh, out on June 22nd, A Bond of Thread with J.P. Burnison. I have this uh, novel with Chris, and um, 
I'm also part of this collective of authors known as AO Collective Publishing, and we're working on a multiverse project. There's about six authors there, including oh, wow. a couple of my current co-authors. So a lot. <laughs> Okay, nice. Well, that sounds like a huge undertaking, the, the multiverse angle. I like that a lot. And, and, and thinking on that, um, let's talk a little bit about how you even go about coordinating co-authoring a book, espe especially the beginning. Like, like how, what, what is, what do the first, I don't know, two or three months look like? Well, usually the, two, the first two or three months are a little bit of writing just to see if you write well together, if it's mm -hmm. fun. Um, and sometimes that just leads straight into the novel. Like Chris and I started writing and we really, we had the inkling of a plan, but then it just kind of took off in a completely different direction and it became kind of an organic thing. Um, but it also, um, also there's a lot of planning it's very easy with co-authoring to have two different ideas of where you're going and then have a lot of trouble later on. So it's a lot of talking, discussing, you know, where we want the book to go, what we want it to be about, what tone we want, and just the logistics of writing a book together. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and so thinking about that, um, you've had multiple rounds of this, but for you, Chris, how, what was it like coming into this fresh, having never co-authored before? Um, uh, well, to be perfectly honest, I was a little bit nervous because writing is um, – people think about writing as a very personal thing, that you are bearing your soul onto the page, that your ideas that have been slushing around in your brain are finally discharging into a medium that someone's going to consume. And, of course, that's why I experienced with Debase Twilight and a few short story anthologies I've been in and different things that I'm working on. And – but co-authoring has been a lot of fun in that you sort of skip the alpha reading stage, I'd say, um, if your, re your listeners have ever heard of that. that. Because as an author, you're always worried about what other people will think or if someone will like what you've done. And because of that, you can kind of get held up. That's uh, where a lot of what people talk about is writer's block comes in. That you are so worried that about making your work perfect that you stop, that you never get it out there. Well, with a co-author, you constantly have a back and forth. They go, oh, I really like that. Or if we tweak this, it'll it'll be better. And they laugh or they giggle at what you wrote. And you get immediate instant gratification. And so you're feeding back and forth off of each other. And you can write four or 5,000 words before even realizing what you've done. And so, like I said, I came in nervous, but it, it was so organic, so fun. Um, I, I would have a blast doing this with, um, of course, with Allegra, but anybody else that's in a similar situation. And now, is your setup, because um, I have never co-authored before, so I have no idea how this goes. Um, is, is your setup mostly, is, is it a chapter by chapter thing, a scene by scene, or are you both growing ideas into the entirety of it? So it's a, it's a kind of a weird question because I've never not I, like I've never co-authored with someone who has co-authored before uh, oh, nice. it's okay. either our first time together or I've been I've done it before so the way that I've always approached it is we're sitting in a voice chat writing like with the same google document open literally tagging back and forth sometimes line by line sometimes paragraph oh, by wow. paragraph okay. the other person is going behind and editing chris's vocabulary and like sentence structure is so much prettier than mine so <laughs> i'll write garbage and he like turns it into actual pretty prose um, but she can write faster than me see, see i'm like an editor writer so i take a lot longer i'm kind of the same way but that's fascinating i had no idea that it was that organic i mean it's like mm -hmm. I mean, it's basically the definition of an idea of like a living document. <laughs> yes. And what's really interesting is um, while there are definitely benefits to doing the chapter by chapter approach, the big benefit of doing it this way, A, is that instant feedback that Chris was talking about. It's super addicting. It's fun. It's, just, it's like hysterically funny sometimes. You're dying of laughter while writing. But there's also this element of, what you write is something that neither of you could have produced on your own. It becomes yeah. a unique style that is a culmination of both of your styles, and it creates a continuous voice that you really don't get if you're going chapter by chapter unless you have two very distinct POVs. Yeah, 
That's we we point. alternate every, I'd say, 500, 600 words or so, typically. But I don't okay. think that anyone would be able to go into the text and pick apart which of us is which. Gotcha. Um, there are jokes that Allegra has come up with that I would never think about. Same with stuff that I've come up with. And it feeds back and forth that we have created characters that have essentially taken over the story and that both of us have been able to feed into that character's voice and continue creating them in a very organic way that it feels like the same person as we pass back and forth. And That's, sometimes mm -hmm. the new characters are because of my many, many, many spelling errors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, th this is in the first chapter, so I can give this joke away. Uh, so we have a chosen one, and the chosen one gets a whole bunch of items from the capital's envoys to mark that he is the chosen one, that he is going to be the hero of eternity. And one of these items is, was originally the Cloak of Perseverance. And Allegra uh, put a little, uh, you had a small spelling error in the middle of Perseverance. So I said, why don't we make this the Cloak of Perseverance? And the, the, the kid goes, D don't you mean the Cloak of Perseverance? No, no, Severance. That There are <laughs> blades in the hymn that are really sharp that have cut off people's limbs. You better be careful. And this has spun into a running gag that is actually central to the story now. The cloak has a name. It is sentient. There's Doctor Strange stuff going on. Nice. So it's like Doctor Strange meets Peaky Blinders? Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm very fascinated in your ability to create a single voice from two heads. That's just, that seems nuts to me. That's, that's really, really fascinating. But you know, it happens every time with every single co-author. And I, I mean, I've seen this method used by my co-authors and other people. So I know it's not a you know, unique thing to me. Mm -hmm. It is kind of magical. It's scary at first because you're <laughs> having to trust another author with your raw text. But eventually it, it, it really does like something magical happens when you're co-authoring and it is beyond explanation. Yeah, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. All right, let's pop back to our cocktail real quick. Um, let's talk smell and taste. They're definitely two of the more overlooked senses in writing. Um, yes, they are. And so let's put on our writing caps right now and, and talk a little bit about what are some of the, the signature tastes of a gin and tonic. Now there's a thousand variations on a gin and tonic, but there, there are those core things that make it what it is. So how, how would you describe that? So you're getting the right person. I was in uh, food science and culinary oh, wow. arts before doing this. And my Perfect. favorite book is Taste What You're Missing, all about the five senses and the five flavors. So this is, this is uh, nice. my other love. Um, for me, the reason I particularly love gin and tonics is the focus on bitter. So rarely do we really get to experience the, the bitter taste. It's one that usually you don't like as kids and a lot of adults don't grow into particularly enjoying. So the bitterness of the quinine and the, even the bitter undertones of juniper berry and all the other herbs that go into gin, for me, create this floral bouquet that you're smelling and you're also smelling through your mouth. Um, there's all these, you know, there's <laughs> your nose is... Um, way more way more engaged in the in your taste of uh sense of taste than most people think um but the fact that the uh bitterness is then cut by just a little sweetness and just a little sour from a citrus to me makes it perfect uh it's refreshing it's light it it, it, it kind of almost enhances the ice it's on it sounds yeah weird, but it, yeah um, no I, I i totally agree it, it is um I feel like it's a really great gateway into bitter. Yes, it is. It's not particularly daunting or um, or scary, a flavor. Mm -hmm. It's not like, you know, intense bitters on something. And it's not particularly strong as a drink. It's meant to be, a, you know, a sipping drink and the ice melts in nicely and you can just enjoy yourself and relax. And to me, that's, that's what having a nice drink is all about. Absolutely. All right, so... Back to co-authoring. What are some of the challenges that come up? Because it can't, it can't all be roses <laughs> working together nonstop for an entire novel. And so the things I'm curious about are when those struggles come up, is there a category they tend to fall into more than others or is it kind of just random things that pop up? So I'm thinking, like, it, are they procedural things that, that cause some friction or interpersonal or 
is it more after the fact with promotion and marketing or you know other categories uh, definitely scheduling. I have yeah. a very, very busy <laughs> yes. life and um, I'm way more flaky than poor Chris deserves. <laughs> no, no, you're fine because it, it's two people trying to get schedules to, to match up. I know that for both of us, this isn't, we want it to be our primary income one day, but it's not at this point that we're both building our audience and building our literary empires, so to speak, hopefully. And there, there's other things that you have to do. You have work, you have appointments, um, you have in Allegra's case a whole bunch of dogs <laughs> and medical conditions. I, I have a whole bunch of dogs too. I have six dogs. <laughs> Jeez, you, have more, yes. you have twice as many dogs yes. as I do. But no, there's there's a lot of things that have to be done, and so um, Allegra also is part of a great D and D group that streams on Twitch. So they have a night for that, and um, I have um, I go for late evening runs, and what else do I do? Uh, um, um, just a whole bunch of stuff. We have our own projects. So yeah. there, there's things that do get in the way, but we, we always try to set aside like three to four days a week where we can work on this in the evening. And, and so, so three to four, three or four days, that's pretty good. How long does a session usually last? Hour or two, sometimes okay. longer. Um, really, we, we can churn out a surprising amount of words in that time. Like usually we're done with a chapter and you know at first we were congratulating ourselves we're like we're epic <laughs> fantasy authors and we wrote an 850 word chapter a 2000 word chapter they're so small <laughs> and the last like six chapters have been over 4k because <laughs> we're epic fantasy authors and it, as it turns out we're not actually as, as good as we like to think we are <laughs> being brief for an hour or two though that's still that's still pretty good um yeah that's that's impressive especially being able to stay focused that long but I guess I guess there's got to be some added energy as as an author who tends to do a lot of keyboard staring. Um, there's got to be a fun extra energy having somebody else right there as you're mm -hmm. trying to produce the words. It's like we were talking about earlier. It's instant gratification that you make a joke and the other person sniggers and yeah. you immediately feel good. The endorphins flow and that adds to your ability to produce your flow that if you are confident in what you are producing, you're going to produce more of it. There's yeah. also the wonderful thing where, you know where you write that sentence and you're just like, oh crap, I don't know where I'm going next. And I can just turn to Chris and be like, tag, you're it. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's a good point. Always, and always you getting also, that You can ask the person, do, do you have a direction for this? And they say yes or no, and then you swap based on that. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, how so, do you see this scene ending? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really cool, that constant, mm -hmm constant check and feedback is mm -hmm. sounds really nice <laughs> so in regard to craft are there things like genre pov language that either help or hinder co-writing um or do you think that anything and everything's fair game and they're all kind of on rough roughly equal footing oh boy um i have at this point written First person, third person, multi POV, single POV, fantasy, science fiction. I would guess that it would be probably harder to write like something incredibly deep or and philosophical where characters like mm -hmm. go deep into their psyche and you want that kind of cohesiveness of character. That might be a little bit harder. Um, I definitely think that co authoring likes fast paced. Um, like action, humor, excitement-driven work because it's an exciting, humorous, action-driven writing process. Uh, Allegra is, likes to say that she goes back and adds detail later, and I've always been a detail-first kind of guy, and we've s settled somewhere halfway in the middle. And the, the funny thing is that I've been less detailed because I'm writing with Allegra, and I think Allegra's been more detailed yes. because she's writing with me, and we're ending up with the right amount of detail. <laughs> that that's really surprising. I would have thought that coming from the opposite ends of the spectrum, though, that that would have been a real sticking point. I, I'm on Team Allegra with this too. I tend to to fill out after the fact, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of my friends are definitely the. I always think of it as I, uh, painters versus sculptors. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely a painter. A little more paint here, a little more paint there. Versus here's my giant chunk of stone. Let me start picking away at it until it becomes mm -hmm. what I want. Yep. Um, and so reconciling that is incredible. I, that, that seems like it would be a huge challenge. Was that something that 
you fell into or is that something that just was naturally there? I think it's more symbiosis. I don't know if Allegra thought about this consciously, but at the beginning I was thinking to myself that I needed to be more concise and that created a uh, the fluidity that I, I now do it unconsciously, but there was very much that conscious thought at first. Yeah, and I, I definitely felt a little bit like, you know, oh, it's Chris. He, he, he's a serious fantasy author. I should clean up my game and put in some descriptions here. Serious? So, you write the same stuff. <laughs> I know, but you know, you know how it's, it, it's that thing. Like, it just, you get, you get impressions of people online and then you're suddenly writing with them and making, <laughs> you know, jokes about spelling mistakes. And then you're like, okay, well, I'll write that. This is going to be fun. Well, let's go a little bit deeper on how your writing styles change when you're co-authoring. Because um, you've both written books solo as well. Mm -hmm. How different is the process? And are there certain tactics or techniques that you just had to jettison from your solo work in order to make the co-authoring work? Or are you a, do you still feel like you have all of your tools available to you? There is so much more pantsing than plotting that happens in co-authored work just by the nature of the um, the organic nature of writing together that it is much harder to do that so co-authoring for me is faster and more enjoyable but I've yet to be able to get the like depth that I feel like I can achieve on my own and um, and definitely when I'm writing on my own I'm much slower so I agree with Allegra on all the points that she made, but for different reasons. Okay. Because, uh, again, we are the same person, but we have come at it from different directions. Mm -hmm. So I am more of a, a pantser on my own than I am co-authoring. That when oh, we, we sat down to do this, that um, we came up with, like, I'm pulling up on Google Docs right now. We have a all um, five-part map, uh, 34 chapters that are continuing to expand what's happening in each chapter, what our character is called in each of those chapters, because that matters to the, the central conceit that we have. Um, but we had a whole bunch of notes. We talked about how everything wanted to come together. But even that amount of plotting is maybe like 20% of it, and 80% is still, oh, this character that was supposed to just be a minor throwaway character is now central to the storyline. We're running with it. And it somehow doesn't mess book. up the plot line. But anyway, in my own work in Divinity's Twilight, like Allegra, I'm very introspective, uh, more philosophical, talking about the morality of kingdoms and empires and the people caught up in these conflicts of gods and men and of natural disasters and wars. And so we very much write the same brand of epic fantasy. And I have things plotted in book one that are going to pay off in books three to six like she does. But mine is, I have a notebook and I have a bunch of post-its and I have everything all over the place, but she probably has a much more cohesive plot line than I do. My a lot plot of it's just map is 10,000 words of color-coded <laughs> Google document spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> well, hey, that, that's better than my collection of Google Docs and sticky notes and notebook pages torn out of notebooks. <laughs> that, that's a little more streamlined. <laughs> One thing I would really like to know, it's come up a couple times now, where do you think that the focus shift happens um, in regard to depth? So you've mentioned a few times now that you feel like when you're co-authoring, the stories um, lose a little bit of depth, but do you feel like that happens, do you feel like it's truly a loss of depth, like is is it just a little bit more topical or do you feel like that that kind of like when you're when you're adding points to a video game character do you feel like you're just putting more points in other categories and it also seems like your the the depth you're talking about tends to happen with your characters more so than necessarily the world building or or other aspects yeah and i, I it's it's hard because on one hand NACL that um it was my first co-authored novel has some themes that are incredibly dark and deep and it's because my uh, Isans and I we wrote it in 6 weeks when we were Whoa. furious about something and angry <laughs> at all these 
things that brought us together and there was just so much emotion thrown onto that page and it was very cathartic to write. So, you know, on one hand, NACL is actually, you know, quite a deep character story, um, but it's not, it's raw. Ah. I feel like the the things that come out when co-authoring tend to be very heartfelt. They tend to be very emotionally driven but they don't necessarily stop to think about themselves in the same way that I feel like Chris and I both tend to write on our own where like you'll have whole chapters of, you know, philosophizing and why is this and yeah, yeah, you know yeah. mm-hmm. all of that. It's like like literally in, in Divinity's Twilight Rebirth, a character spins, I think it's something like 10 pages in the physical edition that he's going on a journey through his mind guided by another character discussing different points in his history or in history itself, that it is this this cool meta discussion on the themes of the book. So it, so it sounds like then it's where things might not get as psychologically deep, the intensity is ratcheted up a bit. Would that be mm-hmm. accurate? Yes. Nice. It's more about speed of delivery. That's probably yeah. the best way to put it. Okay. You're, you're going to discuss the same thing, but I'd say a lot more is left up to subtext. Oh, interesting. Okay. You, you, carry, you carry things more in dialogue than in introspection, which is a good thing in modern fantasy. But I'd say that the pace of co-authoring tends towards modern fantasy trends. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like then the reader's basically doing the same amount of work. It's just slightly different work. Mm-hmm. Yes. So with co-authoring, and this might be aimed a little bit more at Chris since – Allegra is the old pro in the room. Um, but what surprised you most about co-authoring, about the whole experience? Um, I'd say how easy it was, that it could just be Allegra, but it's been nothing short of fun that it, it isn't work. Um, when I'm writing on my own, there is a part of me that goes, well, you could be playing this new game, or you could be uh, going out on a run, or you could be watching that new Netflix series. But you're, you're here creating words that it's something that I enjoy. I, I have stories that I want to tell. I, I want to carry my characters through because I've invested in them, that they feel very real to me, that I want them to have their happy or even tragic ending, depending on what it is. But with co-authoring, I haven't thought for a minute that it's arduous, that it's not work at all. Mm-hmm. And Allegra, how about for you? I mean, you are the old pro, but there still has to be things that are surprising. What's surprising for me usually is the story that comes out at the end is so existentially different than anything I thought it was going to be at the beginning. Oh, that's funny. I am a plotter through and through. I got my, you know, my origin was in pantsing, but I, you know, I have a whole server where, you know, like my whole thing is being a plot mom. I <laughs> help people plot. Um, but they just take off and they take on this life of their own that I don't feel in control of in the best possible way. It feels more like I'm experiencing a, some a media that someone else wrote than I'm writing it. And it's a mind trip. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that that sounds, it's almost like a, like, like the writing X games, like the, like the super intense BMX version of writing. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's awesome. Okay. So what is it? This, this is for both of you. Um, of all of the aspects of co-authoring, what is your favorite part of the process? And go a little bit deep with it. Like, why, why is that the thing that you really cherish or the thing that really um, excites you the most? It's going to be two for me. Okay. Yeah. So the first is waking up to a string of messages. Ah. <laughs> This just brings me this existential joy because it feels like the worlds and the characters come to life and it is just so, so dynamically charged. It feels like I am exploring this magical world that no one else has access to other than one person. And instead of just walking around and wonder, I can just turn to that person and be like, oh my God, what about this? And oh, this, and then they're giving me that feedback. And it's just this, this constant source of joy in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so on the personal level, it's that it's the the constant immersion into the creative process, which helps all my other writing too, and it helps me get through the workday, and it it just it it's it's so invigorating. Um, but there is also this um, this thing that that um, it's kind of tied to that where. I will watch Chris type or any of my other authors and I try to guess what he's going to type next. Mm. <laughs> and there's a point at the writing process, which usually happens around the halfway point of the book. And it's very, very exciting. And it happens every time where you start being able to exactly predict what the other person is going to write <laughs> <laughs> and your ideas just meld. And then the ending just happens. It gives you this sense of almost, um, just like yes, I, I get it. I am a writer. I am getting this whole writing process. It's this is this is working. This is something I can do. It, it, it's it's very much for me. These books just appear in a matter of like a month or two, and they're great. And they're not something I could have written alone. And it makes me write every day. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know if I would write every day if I didn't co-author. Uh, to tack onto what Allegra said not to sound cheesy or anything or to, to bring up things from the star Wars prequels that we, we don't really <laughs> approve of as writers, but it's sort of like you're part of the midi chlorians, the force <laughs> that you have, you've blended together into one seamless being that is, is producing an incredible story that you have become the writing process itself. That you're able to see pages and chapters ahead the, you, through the the efforts of another mind, through linking of your mutual ideas. And one of my favorite parts of that is like the characters. I keep bringing back, coming back to the characters, that whether I create a character or Allegra creates a character, just being able to see them take on a life of their own, even though we're both writing, is an incredible thing. It's, it's almost like watching a child grow up that I, I know I'm not a parent myself, so I'm only imagining but I, I can think about it in a dog's term. I've, I've raised a number of dogs, and it's just there's so much joy, so much energy, so much passion involved in that process that it's, it can be almost tear-jerking at times. That way, even if it's not a tragic scene, even we're, we're writing predominantly comedy, and it's still just tears of joy at how beautiful it can be at times. Or tears of laughter when we're yes. like clutching yes, our sides, trying to not lose it while typing. Oh, yep. That's great. Well, it's good that it's not tears of despair because that would be. <laughs> oh, there's there's a few of those. The tragedy yeah. forms the basis of this. It's just wrapped in all the rest. Gotcha. <laughs> all right, so let's pop back to our gin and tonic. Um, one of the things that the gin and tonic is known for is its versatility. Um, Everyone has their favorites. Everyone has their favorite recipes, their favorite ingredients. Um, so what are your go-to recipes and ingredients when you're making yourself a gin and tonic? Well, I am a little bit of a purist. I, I really like just high-quality gin, high-quality tonic. And I'm very particular about my citrus. It is lemons in the spring and limes in the summer. Interesting. So you are on both teams, but depending oh, on the time, a temporal citrus person. That's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm devoutly team lem or team lime. My wife is devoutly team lemon. Um, so I always have to have both. Um, do you have so when you say high quality gin and high quality tonic? Are there, is it basically the same gin and the same tonic, or do you have a few that you cycle between? Um, I have some favorites. Um, Bombay Sapphire is definitely my favorite. Um, I've gone through a few local gins from one of my uh, local distilleries that I've really liked, although I can never remember the names of them. I kind of just go up to his stall in our local market, farmer's market, and I'm like, what's good? And he hands me a couple bottles, and I nice. leave. <laughs> um, but... And, you know, tonic, I, this one um, that I'm using right now is a San Pellegrino tonic, um, which is more bitter than most. And I actually have, like, tonic bitters to add to gin and tonics if oh, I'm feeling extra. Um, <laughs> but part of the reason is that I like my drinks fairly bitter because I'm a huge lightweight. And if I sip very slowly, I don't make a fool of myself. And if Gosh. I leave my gin and tonics <laughs> too sweet, I am under the table and probably should not be ne left near my computer to write. 
I, I'll have to try the San Pellegrino tonic. I didn't even know they made a tonic. It's interesting. It's very nice. Is Does it have a specific color for the bottle or can, or is it their typical green? Um, It's a bottle. It's uh, clear with a brown label. Gotcha. Okay. I'll keep an eye out for it. Yeah, for me, I feel like I... I I kind of have three modes with gin and tonic. Like right now I just have the typical good old Gordon's with some Schweppes, like the, just the standard classic. Yeah. Um, and I would say my favorite is probably, have you ever had the botanist gin? Yes. Yeah. Oh yes. So good. That, that one's probably my favorite gin and really with any tonic that works really well. But one thing I found really interesting, especially if you use fever tree, Mm-hmm. is Hendrix Gin. Hendrix Gin, Fever Tree, and then no citrus, cucumber. Ooh, absolutely. Cucumber and cucumber and mint especially go Ooh, so yeah. well with gin. Yeah. Sage, actually, fresh sage works really well. Yes. Um, really, the fact that there's juniper and so many herbs in gin just makes it the perfect vehicle for pretty much anything that you grow in a garden. There are a lot of times we'll have like a barbecue and what I'll do is just make a giant pitcher and I just walk out into my garden, grab every herb that looks good that I can find, throw it in, throw some, some strawberries in, gin, top it with tonic, and no one's complained yet. Have you ever tried making your own gin? I have not. Um, we are more of a brewing cider and mead sort of household. Well, so not not necessarily distilling your own gin, but there... So after the show, remind me, I, I'll... I'll give you some recipes it's it's basically vodka tea the vodka tea version of gin um super easy super fun so i will definitely discuss that later um but let's turn let's let's get a little serious now let's turn to an important question is co-authoring a book together with somebody else something that you think everyone should try or do you think it takes a certain kind of author to pull it off to pull not only to pull off the completion of the book but to pull off the co-authoring relationship I mean, we could give you the uh, cop-out answer, which is, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would advise everyone to try it. That I think that some part of me always wanted to co-author a book, but I never even considered it before I met Allegra. Um, but I, my life is so much better since then that both my own writing process, my enjoyment of writing... Um, the incredible story that we've created together that I, it's not something I could have done on my own. And I think I said that to you when I came to you originally, that I did not think that I could do the idea justice on my own. And wow, well, I think we've done it justice together. <laughs> yes. Um, I think that it is good for anyone who can let go of their preconceptions of what a story needs to be enough to relax into it. If you're one of those people who you have a vision and it must be put on paper exactly as you imagine it, and the, uh, the idea of something unknown or something changing it is stressful for you, co-authoring isn't for you. It is a very organic process. Um, so if you're, the, if you're the person who just did the group project in school, you're probably not the person yeah. to co-author. Yes. You, you need to be able to trust someone else and not be so attached to what you think the book will be to then um, be unable to recognize what the book could be. Gotcha. It sort of also comes down to, and this is the same thing you talk about authors when they're getting either beta feedback or reviews. If you can't take criticism, if you can't say somebody somebody telling you this is how we could make it better, it's probably not for you. So picture you have two absolute newbies sitting in front of you, and they're like, we want to co-author a book together, and we've neither one of us has ever done it before. What advice would you have for them to start from absolute scratch? Well, um, the first thing is if you can – and you know someone, and I am always open to this, really, seriously, ask established co-authors to view their process. I cannot mm. tell you how many times I've invited someone new onto a Discord with me and one of my co-authors to just have them observe how we work it, because it's very hard to explain the process and explain why it works. Um, so if that is available to you, absolutely take that up first and foremost. Uh, it will solve a lot of your problems. And then 
Um, the first thing I would say is make sure you agree on all the fundamentals, how long you want the project to take, what the project is going to be about, what genre, what writing style, what pace, like all those logistical potential pitfalls. And make sure that you're in the same place in your careers that you seri are serious about publishing or just want to do this for a lark. Like Chris and I didn't really have to have those discussions because we've had the same career. We published mm -hmm. at the same time. We do the same things. We're in the same circles. We're both trying to make big multiverses mm -hmm. of serious fantasy out, you know. Uh, the other tagline that we talk about with each other is this project is what happens when two disgruntled epic fantasy authors get together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but for two brand new co-authors, it's really important that you both have the same goal in mind with the project and are willing to communicate and willing to take critique. So are there specific resources or apps or forums or, or places you would send people who are about to step into a co-authoring situation? Well, um, First of all, GDocs is where you want to co-author. You can be on there at the same time and work on the same document and it's live and it's interactive. And there is nothing as far as I know that is out there that beats it for co-authoring. Um, and as far as communities, co-authors are weird. There's a lot of them out there, but they don't often like advertise it or talk about it. I feel like a lot of co-authoring happens in like weird closets somewhere. Um, <laughs> it's a secret cult. <laughs> it is a secret cult. Um, as I said, I'm always happy to share and help people. I run a Discord and I have a YouTube channel and we talk about it fairly frequently and there's a lot of people co-authoring there. So it's an open community and people are welcome to. And also just to to ask for mentorship, especially in the indie author community, there is an author doing everything. And most indie authors are willing to help another indie author out. Um, I don't know of any direct like repositories on co-authoring because I don't think if they're out there, I've yet to find them. Mm -hmm. I would say that if you're looking for stuff to plan your project together, um, Allegra and I have, of course, used Google Docs to, for all of our plotting documents, as well as keeping hard files um, on our own computers. But there are the big ones. There's Campfire. There are other, either whether you're doing a D&D campaign or you're planning a book, there's software that you can do your world building together. You can construct a wiki. Uh, you can find uh, you again. You can just do it in a Google Doc where you can both work together to do all that. Um, Allegra and I have sort of pantsed our world building because we're going to have to go back and do a lot of editing of book one based on what happens in book two anyway. But that that's neither here nor there. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna kind of pull something out of left field here. Hopefully you two will be comfortable with this, but I'm so intrigued with the way that you're working together. I would like to combine this, this co-authorship skill with our drink of the night. Okay. Drinks often have a certain mood and they have a certain setting that is evoked by the drink. Um, gin and tonic is a pretty broad one because it, it can be fancy or someone could hand it to you in a keg cup and you'll be happy either way. But do you think, would you be willing to work with each other, just real quick, on setting a scene for gin and tonic? All right, so I'll do my best with this as well, because uh, th this is for your, re your, your audience, the listeners. I don't actually drink, so just personal choice, don't really like the taste, prefer water, because I'm, I'm an exercise nut as well. So I, I was telling Jim earlier, I came in here with diet water, and that's why I haven't been weighing it on the alcohol. So Allegra can start us off, and I will do my best to support her, as I do as a co-author. Right. So we're painting a word picture, right? Yes, yes. All right. It's a garden party. Okay. But I don't know anyone. Oh, okay. So I'm the gin and tonic's your friend. <laughs> yes, I'm wandering around clutching a gin and tonic because I walked up to the bar and it was the first thing that popped into my head. It's that summer favorite and I saw a bottle of gin behind the counter. Um, 
but as I'm wandering through the um, through this this garden party, kind of avoiding people, um, I hear something behind the house. It sounds like there are people talking in a hushed voice about something. Chris, take it away. So very surreptitiously, you sidle up to the ferns. There's there's a bunch of bushes that are obscuring this uh, occurrence behind the house. As you get closer, the voices start to materialize. We, we have to go now. If, if we don't go now while everyone's distracted, we're not going to be able to get the goods. We have to get them out now. You take a step back. What goods? Why are these people huddled around? Why are they wearing dark robes? You, you just want to enjoy your drink. You want to keep sipping. But there's something bitter in there. There's this aftertaste you just can't get rid of. So you keep listening and hope that they tell you a little bit more about their plans. Tag. As uh, you crouch behind this bush, clutching the gin and tonic to your chest because now it is your only lifeboat and you are convinced that there is possibly a heist going on. Um, you see someone moving towards the bushes. You shove yourself inside. and You see they're hauling a crate across the yard. There's a car parked in the, um, in the driveway just around the corner, but it's not just any car. It is a hearse. Yep. <laughs> it's covered in bumper stickers yes and we're talking about like old big band bumper stickers like it sounds it looks like someone took the least conspicuous vehicle possible and made it even less conspicuous <laughs> <laughs> or even more more conspicuous i should say and as you hear the uh, rattle of the bottles that seem to be inside this crate, you realize that there in the, in the cracks between the wood slats is the label of the exact gin that you have in your cup. And there's definitely a dark cult moving it into a hearse. Something is wrong. Chris, take it away. <laughs> so you're rather distressed that this party is going to be ruined. They are making off with all the alcohol, all the gin and tonics. Nobody's going to be able to get refills. This is going to be a calamity, which plays into our story. We say calamity a lot. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a calamity. You look around. Nobody else seems to have noticed. There's no, no authorities. If you dial 911, you're going to be too late. You have to do something. As they get the, the casket... Because it's, a, it's actually a casket. It's not just a crate. They have moved this in a full-on casket. It's silver. It has a cross etched on the front. It has golden rails that they've been using to carry it. They get into the back of the hearse. They slam the trunk closed. There's a bumper sticker that falls off. It says, Virginia's for lovers. It drifts <laughs> onto the road, sad and alone. <laughs> you have no choice. They, they, saw, they file into the front of the hearse. They close the doors. You're going to have to make a move. You hop onto the rear bumper plate. You grip the back of the vehicle. You're going to follow this gin to wherever their hideout is. Then you'll call 911. You have to save the alcohol. Tag. <laughs> and as you drive off on a mission to save the alcohol, you have a moment to wonder, am I doing this? Because I actually want to save this party where I know no one and... a Gin and tonic was my only friend? Or am I doing this because anything would be better than being here? <laughs> the end. Scene. Nice. Very, very, very well done. Thank you. I thought you were going to say it's to save Jin because Jin's awesome. <laughs> no, we have a character in the story that's called Jin. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> nice. Well, all right, Allegra and Chris, it's last call here in the indie pub. Can you give an indie published book or two or a few that you want more people to check out? Absolutely. Um, well, we were kind of thinking about this before coming on here, and we felt that it, we needed to 
do at least one funny book. We're writing fantasy comedy. So we would like to absolutely recommend Orconomics by J. Zachary Price. It is a hoot and hysterical and absolutely fantastic. Perfect. And we also wanted to hit some other indie titles, um, the other people that have been a, a great contributors to the indie fantasy scene, especially with indie fantasy addicts. And those are Rachel Renner. She wrote The Girl Who Talks to Ashes, as well as an amazing urban fantasy series called The Lightning Conjurer. has an incredible elemental magic system. If you like elemental magic, you need to go check that out. As well as our good friend uh, Jeffrey Kahanek. And he has amazing character work in his uh, Fall of Wizardom series. That's the most recent release, as well as the prequel to that, which is The Fate of Wizardoms. Um, a bunch of pol politics, a bunch of scheming by people that can use incredible, uh, world-changing magic. So great epic fantasy series. Okay, same question, but for any other media, indie or not. Oh, I feel like both of us have been like binge watching Shadow and Bone <laughs> on Netflix. So that's mm -hmm. all we've been talking about recently. It's a lot of fun, a, a, a little, little tropey. It's like you can <laughs> see the tropes oozing from the pores, except it's so well acted and like pretty to look at that you're like, oh, oh, it's okay. Maybe I'm only noticing this because I'm a fantasy author, and even though we, <laughs> we all know what the tropes are. <laughs> Okay, finally, tell our audience what you have going on and where they can find you and your work. Okay, I'm Christopher Russell. I uh, write a bunch of epic fantasy with, um, there's a, a lot of noble, heroic themes as well as some dark and grimdark in there. Um, of course, I'm holding this book up that no one's going to see. This is Divinity's Twilight <laughs> Rebirth. I always do this, so even though this is only going out in audio, uh, you can find it on Amazon, of course, my website, ChristopherRussellAuthor.com. I'm sure Jim's going to have my name spelled out somewhere attached to this. Oh, yeah. so you'll be Absolutely. able to find that. Uh, you can also find it on Barnes & Noble. Um, there are some stores that carry it. I'm very thankful to them for them doing that. Uh, you're also going to be able to find me on social media. My Instagram is Christopher underscore Russell underscore author. My Twitter is Chris underscore DT underscore author. And then my uh, Facebook is uh, Divinity's Twilight Fantasy Novels. So... If you just look up my name, you should or go to the website. You'll be able to find links to everything else and all the other projects I have going on. Uh, there's the big project I'm doing with Allegra. Uh, books two and three of Divinity's Twilight are coming down the pipe. Uh, the second book's in beta reading right now. And then I'm also working on um, some standalones that have some cool Asian and post-apocalyptic themes that are going to be set in the same universe. Because like Allegra, I have to have a multiverse. <laughs> And you can find me pretty much on any social media as author Allegra. Um, I also have a sorely neglected YouTube channel, Plot Mom, and a Discord server that's always teeming and loves having new people. We write there almost every day and have a lot of fun. Um, you can also find me at authorallegra.com and uh, find out more about my other co-authors, my larger multiverse project. And at last, you I can find my books on Amazon and Audible. My um, debut novel, Where Shadows Lie, just recently released as an audiobook, and it's absolutely fantastic. The narrator was a dream to work with, so you should check it out. Oh, and also, I'd be remiss if I didn't pitch for both of us that, no, again, nobody can see this, but from the shadows, both Allegra and I have short stories in this, along with a bunch of other talented indie fantasy addicts authors. And we're currently working on putting together a second fa fantasy anthology. The first one was focusing on villains. It's permanently free, no charge. Go download the ebook from Amazon, from the shadows. And then the second one we're working on right now is Retired Heroes, also going to be perma free, releasing this fall. And we're co-authoring on that one. Yes. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to the Indie Pub. If you like what you hear, consider giving us a like and subscribe so you won't miss any of our indie investigations or boozy banter. I've been your host, Jay Rushing, and we'll see you back in the pub next time. Mm -hmm.